Aloha students and welcome to the lecture on chapter 7. In chapter 7 we're going to be talking about budgeting. Most of you are familiar with the concept of budgeting so I won't get into that much detail on it but there's two main purposes for budgeting. One is planning so trying to plan for the effective use of resources in the future and then control. So another purpose of budgeting is to make sure that things um, were done the way they were planned on being done. So did, in other words, did um, management meet its objectives and meet the budget? Here you can see some purposes of the budget. I won't get into that much detail on this. Um, and then there's some, in a list of benefits of budgeting. Um, again, won't get into that too much, but um, you know, Budgeting is a good process to do things like coordinative act, coordination of activities, making sure people are on the same page, making sure people know what's coming up. Budget process helps with that. Uh, manage by, management by exception basically says <clears throat> you concentrate on things that aren't the norm. So what not, are not what you expect and budgeting helps uh, identify um, those things that need attention cost-conscious employees. So, you know, those of you who work in companies that have a budgeting process know that you're always looking at the budgets and determining if uh, <clears throat> the actual results are going to be uh, in line with budgets. So people are cost-conscious. Okay. Um, this is not as critical, um, but here's some general principles of budgeting. Um, Budgeting is not only financial information, but it integrates financial, non-financial um, issues. <clears throat> to be effective, budgeting needs top management support. It needs employee participation in the process. It leads to effective communication. Um, this is something that some organizations don't have is you need flexibility in the budgeting process. A lot of companies have rolling budgets where their budget is revisited every month and then revised. Okay, so, um, and then follow up is important. To, um, you can't just make a budget. You got to compare the budget afterwards to the actual results for it to be of any value. <clears throat> Uh, the concept of participatory budget system means that in preparing a budget, in um, administering and operating a budget, it should be from the bottom up. So there should be feedback about budget preparation from all levels of the company. Okay. So it shouldn't be a top down kind of a thing where management mandates to the company, here's what your budget is. It should be a more participatory, more with more feedback. Okay, so now we get into the details of budgets. The master budget is kind of like a summary. Um, all of the other budgets that we're gonna see are constructed for specific things. Sales, for example, purchases, uh, that type of thing. So the master budget consolidates or puts together all of the other detailed budgets into a single master budget, which is your projected income statement and your projected balance sheet. It's so obviously this master budget. Oops. So this master budget is obviously done after all of the other detailed budgets are um, completed and it's sort of like the summary of all of those. Okay, the first budget <clears throat> or the first step in the budgeting process is the sales budget. We have to do the sales budget first because in order to try to budget how much we're going to spend, we first have to know how much we have available to be spent. And that's what the sales budget is all about. Okay, how much are we going to sell in the budgeting period that we're looking at? Okay, <clears throat> um, let's see. Okay, so 
actually this this should say sales budget example so i think the uh, title here is wrong but this is a specific sales budget i believe yeah so anyway they're this magnet company is preparing budgets for the quarter ended june 30. the sales price averages ten dollars a magnet okay so in this whole budgeting process we have to make assumptions about average sales prices because obviously they probably have a whole bunch of different kinds of magnets that sell for all kinds of different prices. So um, we're assuming a $10 per magnet is an average of everything they sell. So um, let's keep that in mind as the assumption when we're doing all of this budgeting stuff. Okay, so... <clears throat> Oops. Okay, so the budget for April, May, June, and July, and you'll see here, we need to know July, so uh, we know how much the ending inventory needs to be for June. But anyway, here's the sales budget. So 20,000 magnets in April, we're going to sell, or we estimate to sell. 50,000 magnets in May, and 30,000 magnets in June. Again, we're assuming the average price is $10. <clears throat> there are companies that have very detailed budgets where they have uh, estimates of each type of magnet with all the different prices. And that's a very complex process, but it's done in many companies. And we have accounting departments strictly devoted to doing that budgeting and do that year round. But anyway, we're taking for purposes of this class a really simplistic approach assumption that all the magnets average $10. So we're going to use that for all of them. Okay, so April, our sales are 200,000, May 500,000, June 300,000. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, so that's the sales budget. Very simple. The estimate of how many we're going to sell each month or each quarter times the selling price that we're assuming for each one. So that gives us the sales budget. Okay, so again, sales budget, fairly straightforward. Okay, now that we know how many we're gonna sell, production budget, um, we need to know then, next step, how many do we need to make? Okay, this is a company that makes its own magnets, obviously, because there's production, so they're making them. If we were buying the inventory from someone, this would be called the purchases budget or inventory purchases budget. Same concept is how many do we have to either make or buy based on how many we budgeted to sell. Okay, So obviously, if we're going to sell units, we have to make all of those units or, or buy all of those units. But there's an extra consideration. This company wants ending inventory to be 20% of next month's budgeted sales. Okay, And the reason they want to have ending inventory is they want some extra inventory there for two reasons. One is they were budgeting 20,000 magnets sold in April. Well, what if they actually could have sold more? They want to have some extra there in this case, 20% of next month's sales, as a cushion or a just-in-case they sell more than the budget kind of a thing. Because you remember, a budget is an estimate. An estimate is an educated guess. So <clears throat> if the company expected to sell 20,000 magnets and they made exactly 20,000 magnets, what happens if they had another order then for another 100? They couldn't sell that extra hundred because they wouldn't have made all of that many. They would have only made the two hundred or the twenty thousand that they budgeted for. Okay, so they want to have extra on hand just in case they sell more. The other reason, perhaps, is <clears throat> you want to have some extra inventory there at the end of the month so that they can start the new month with some inventory on hand, so they don't have to start making them from scratch. Okay, they have some to be sold the first day already. Okay. Okay, so another piece of information is that there's 4,000 units on hand at the end of March. Okay, we're going to now prepare a production budget. 
So the production, you have to make enough to meet that month's budgeted sales, plus you want to have that extra cushion in ending inventory. So the basic production budget or purchases budget, if you're buying it, is a budgeted sales in units for the month, plus the extra that you want to have on hand in ending inventory. That's how many product units in total that we need. But we don't have to make all of those because we already have some from the ending inventory of the previous month. And remember, the ending inventory of one month is the beginning inventory of the following month. <clears throat> so we need a total of this many total product units, but we already have some that's sitting in inventory, so we can subtract that, giving us the number of units that we do have to produce or buy. <clears throat> so here's a production budget then using the numbers we saw earlier. We said April, we're budgeting 20,000 units to be sold. We wanted to have 10, a 20% of the following month's budget of uh, unit sales in ending inventory. Following month, we're expecting to sell 50,000. So 20% of that is this 10,000 that we're gonna have on hand as a just in case. So the total we're gonna sell plus the 10,000 extra we want to have on hand just in case gives us the total of 30,000 that we need. <clears throat> However, as the problem previous uh, slide indicated, we had 4,000 in beginning inventory at the beginning of April. So we don't have to make those, they're already made. So we can subtract that from what we need. So we have to make 26,000. Okay, then the next month, <clears throat> we know we need 50,000 to account for the sales we budget. We need an extra 6,000, which is 20% of the following month sales. 20% of 30,000 is the six. So we need a total of 56,000 units, but we already have 10 units. And here you can see the ending inventory of April goes down to the beginning inventory of May. Okay, so we don't have to make those 10,000, they're already made. So we do have to make the difference of 46,000, okay? 30,000 units. We wanna have 20% of next month. Previously in the problem, it indicated that July had um, sales were gonna be 25,000. So 20% of 25,000 is this 5,000. That's why we need the July sales numbers in order to get this ending inventory of June. We already have 6,000, so we don't have to make all of these 35 that we need. That 6,000 comes from the prior month's ending inventory. So we need to make or produce 29,000 units. Okay, that's the production budget. Um, the tricky thing here is trying to figure out the ending inventory and the beginning inventories. Okay. But an, a, a key is ending inventory one month becomes the beginning inventory the following month. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have a production budget and we know how many units we're gonna make, now we have to figure out how much materials to buy to make those units. So the basic formula or, or uh, structure is the units that we're gonna produce times the materials needed for each unit gives us the total materials that we need to make those quantities of units. But again, materials, just like inventory of product, we wanna have some extra on hand just in case. So that's the desired units of material and ending inventory. And we'll see how that <clears throat> works in a second. Okay, so the material that we need to make the number that we're gonna make, plus the extra, the cushion, that gives us the total units of material that we need. But we don't have to buy all of those because we already have some in inventory. 
That's the units of material in beginning inventory. Subtract that, give, it gives us the units of materials we have to buy. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example. So let's say that there's five pounds of material that are needed for each unit that we make. So this Ellis wants to have materials on hand at the end of the month equal to 10% of next month's production. So that's the cushion that just in case, let's hold some extra material. Okay. So they wanna hold 10% of the following month's production needs. At the end of March, there were 13,000 pounds of materials on hand. July production is budgeted to be 23,000 units. And we'll see how we use that information in a second. Okay, so here's the material purchases budget based on our um, <clears throat> example of that magnet maker. 26,000 units <coughs> is the units that we're gonna produce in April. And here that is, and when we did the production budget, we came up with that number. <clears throat> That's how many units we're gonna make. But it takes five pounds of materials for each unit. <clears throat> so that means we need a total of 130,000 units to make those 26,000. Again, so, sorry, 130,000 um, pounds of materials we're gonna need to make the 26,000 units. <clears throat> Plus we wanna have some extra inventory of materials equal to 10% of the materials needed for the following month. The following month we need 230,000 pounds of materials. So 10% we're gonna hold that as the extra cushion the just in case. So the total materials that we need is the 150,000 pounds. But we already have 13,000 pounds in the beginning inventory at the beginning of the month. So we don't have to purchase those, we already have those. So the materials that we do purchase is the $140,000, the 153,000 minus the 113,000. For May, we need, we're gonna make 46,000. Going back two slides, you can see that, 46,000. Again, that's how many units, 46,000. Takes five pounds of materials for each unit, so we need a total of 230,000 pounds of material. But again, we have, <clears throat> uh, we want 10% of next month's materials needs as a cushion this month. So 10% of the 145 is the 14.5. Add that to the materials needed for the production. So we need a total of 244,500 units, I'm sorry, pounds of materials. But again, we don't have to buy all of that because we already have 23,000 in beginning inventory. And again, we get that from the ending inventory of the prior month. So we have to buy 221,500. Okay, and the same thing for June. Again, though, 10% of next month for the desired ending inventory, we need to know the July material need. And you can, um, <clears throat> you can see that 11,005. Um, well, it tells us the ending inventory is 11,005, so in the problem. Okay, so that's the materials purchases budget. Okay, so now we've seen the sales budget, production budget, and material purchases budget. Oh, excuse me, I'm, uh, I'm yawning like crazy here. Um, excuse the, uh, the weird noises coming out, but that's, that's me yawning. Okay, so now that we know how much materials we're going to buy, we're going to figure out the cash payments for those materials, okay? <clears throat> so let's say that the material costs four cents a pound. 
one half of a month's purchases are paid for that month. The other half is paid the following month. No discount terms are available. So you remember from your financial accounting that when companies sell products or services to other companies, they most of the time give them time to pay and then they take what's called an accounts receivable. So people owe them money. Okay. Um, so in this case, <clears throat> um, the people that purchase, well, they purchase materials from other people. They're usually given a month to pay. So um, half, in the case of this company, half of the purchases they make for a month, they pay for in the same month. And then the other half is paid the following month. Okay. So at the end of March, the accounts payable balance, that's how much money they owe to the suppliers, was $12,000. Okay, so let's take a look at the cash payments budget for materials. So materials purchases, the 140, 221, 5, and the 142 come from here, the material purchases budget. That's how many pounds of materials we have to buy. The cost per pound, again, it's an average, is 40 cents per pound. Multiplying it out, we get a cost of $56,000 for materials in April, $88,600 as materials for May, $56,800 materials for June. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. The problem tells us that the accounts payable balance in March at March 31st is 12,000. So we need to pay that and pay that in the following month. So we pay that in April. And then of this $56,000 that we're buying in April, half of it is paid for in April, the 28,000. The other half is paid for in May. That's the other 28,000. Likewise, this $88,600 purchases in May, half of that, $44,300, is paid for in May. The other half is paid for next month in June. And then we did the same thing for June, $56,800 of purchases. Half of that, $28,400, is paid for in this month of June. The other half will be paid for in July. Okay. So... You can see the total payments for the month, 40,000 in April, 72,300 in May, 72,700 in June. Okay, so remember not only are they paying for half of this month's, but they're also paying for half of last month's. Okay. That's a cash payments budget for materials. Excuse me. Looking at cash payments for direct labor, okay, the problem has the assumptions that each unit produced requires three minutes of direct labor. So it takes the worker three minutes to make the product. Three minutes is 0 0.05 hours. Ellis employs 30 people for 40 hours a week at a rate of $10 an hour. Um, if they need extra help and there's extra hours that are needed to be filled, then they get temporary workers that also cost $10 an hour. Okay, so for April, we're looking at the cash payments for labor. So there's 26,000 units that we're going to produce three minutes each or 0 0.05 hours for each one. It'll take us 1,300 hours to make those 26,000 units. 2,300 in May, 1,450 in June. Okay, those are how many labor hours we need. We're going to be charging $10 an hour. And again, that's an average Obviously, the workers have various levels of uh, what they get paid, but again, we're using averages here. Okay, so the direct labor cost is 13000 in April, 23000 in May, 14500 in June. 
Okay, that's the cash payments budget. The third element of uh, production costs, besides direct materials and direct labor, which we've already seen, is the cash payments for manufacturing overhead. So let's say that variable manufacturing overhead costs are a dollar per unit. Remember, variable costs are always uh, expressed as per unit. Fixed manufacturing overhead is 50000 a month. And for fixed costs, it's always expressed as a monthly total. This fixed manufacturing overhead of $50,000 includes depreciation. And as you remember from financial accounting, depreciation is the using up of a fixed asset, and it's not any cash outflow. You don't pay cash for depreciation. You've already paid the cash when you purchase the asset. Depreciation is simply recording the expensing or the using up of part of that asset, and it's not a cash outlay. So looking at the cash payment for manufacturing overhead for April, 26,000 units to produce. The previous slide says the variable part is $1 for each unit of overhead, uh, each unit produced. So $1 is the overhead for variable overhead. So variable overhead cost is 26,000 in April, 46 in May, 29 in June. The fixed overhead is 50000 a month. And remember, fixed overhead doesn't change. It stays the same regardless of volume. So we add the fixed overhead to the variable overhead, 76000 in April, 96000 in May, 79000 in June. But not all of that is a cash outlay. So we have to subtract depreciation which again does not require cash to be paid out. So we subtract that from the total manufacturing overhead to give us our cash required to pay for manufacturing overhead. Okay, so 56 in April, for example, 76 in May. Okay, that's the cash payment for manufacturing overhead budget. As far as selling and administrative expenses, um, normally selling expense contains elements of both variable and fixed costs. So the variable costs may be things like shipping costs. So the more you sell, the more the shipping costs go up. Sales commissions, the more you sell, the more commissions you have to pay. So those are variable. They go up or down with volume. Administrative costs are mostly fixed costs. So salaries, for example, um, depreciation on machinery and equipment in the back office, the corporate offices, okay, those are all fixed costs. Okay, so here's an example. So we have, let's say, variable selling and administrative costs are 50 cents per unit sold. Remember, when we have a variable, any kind of a variable cost, it's always expressed as a per unit. The fixed selling and administrative expenses are 70000 a month. And again, fixed expenses are quoted or uh, presented as a per month or per period type cost. So fixed selling and administrative expenses, so the 70000 includes $10,000 of depreciation. And as we said earlier, depreciation does not require cash to be paid out. Okay, so here's the cash payments budget for selling and administrative expenses. We budgeted unit sales as 20 in April, 50 in May, 30 in June. Previous slide said the variable selling and administrative expense was 50 cents per unit. giving us variable s uh, a expense, selling and administrative expense of 10,000 April, 25,000 May, 15,000 June. 
The fixed portion of the selling and administrative expenses was 70,000. And again, that's a monthly amount. Doesn't change regardless of changes in volume or increases or decreases in sales. So we need a total of 80,000 for selling and administrative expenses, 95 in May, 85 in June. But we don't have to pay all of that out in cash because we have depreciation in there within the 80,000, 95 and 85. So the 10,000, we're not paying cash for that. That's We've already paid the cash when we purchased the asset. So this is simply the expensing out of uh, that in the form of depreciation. So the cash we need is 70,000 in April, 85 in May, and 75 in June. Okay, so that's the cash payments budget for uh, sales and administration. Okay, let's now take a look at cash receipts. Okay, this relates to the sales that we made during the month. And their collection period, again, when they sell to their customers, they're giving them uh, time to pay. That's an accounts receivable. So their collect this company's collection pattern is 70% of the money or the sales made in a month is collected that month. 20%, 25%, excuse me, of the sales that occur in this month will be paid ne uh, next month received next month and 5% of the receivables will never be collected it's uncollectible okay so accounts receivable balance at the end of March is 30,000 so here's cash receipts budget April again we see the budgeted sales for April 20 May 50 and June 30,000 the price per unit was ten dollars. You remember, so the budgeted sales revenues was two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We said that seventy percent of this month's sales are going to be collected this month in cash. So seventy percent of the two hundred thousand is this one forty thousand. Seventy percent of the five hundred thousand dollars sales in May is going to be collected the same month so 35,000 okay in addition to the 70 percent of this month's sales you remember that 25 percent of the prior month's sales are collected this month as well so the 3,000 is accounts receivable is 30,000 so on March 31st so that's all collected in April. Yeah. So that's 170,000 cash collected from sales. For May, the sales are budgeted to be 500,000. Again, 70% of that is collected the same month. That's the 350. <clears throat> so that means the uh, another 20% is going to be collected the following month. So 300,000 times 20% is the 125. And then you remember the 200,000 sales, 70% or 140 was collected the same month in April. And then 20% was collected the following month. So 20% of the, sorry, 25% of the 200,000 is the 50,000. Okay, so you do the same thing every month to get the total cash receipts. Okay, so um, I think for the next, yeah. So a, uh, the next step in the process, and I'll just leave it here, um, is <clears throat> coming up with a comprehensive cash budget. So a budget that includes a cash budget that includes both the cash coming in and the cash going out. Okay, so we had forty thousand dollars of cash at the beginning of April, and they tell you that somewhere in the problem here, maintain a minimum of thirty. 
Okay, so they had 40, though, in the beginning of the month. Cash receipts were 170, and we saw that in the cash receipts budget. The cash payments, these are taken off of all of the uh, individuals, so the materials budget. <clears throat> 40,000 was going to be paid out in cash. The labor, 13, for example. Manufacturing overhead, and then um, selling and administrative budgets. This quarter, the dividend is going to be paid, $51,000. Okay. So taking all the cash that comes in, 210, minus the cash that goes out, 230, we get a negative $20,000. So <clears throat> one of the uh, other provisions in the uh, um, previous slide said that the company always wants to keep it's hard to read, excuse me, but it maintains a $30,000 minimum cash balance. So it always wants to have $30,000 in the bank. But because they had a loss of cash of $20,000, in order to maintain the $30,000 ending balance, they have to come up with $50,000 to get from the negative 20 it is now to the 30 that they want it to be Okay, so they have to borrow, in essence, the $50,000, okay? So if these cash budgets, if they need cash, they have to borrow it. And in the case of June here, if they have extra cash, like this 95, remember, they want to have 30 at all times. So they have an extra 65000 now in the June. So what do you do with the extra money? The first thing you do is pay down or repay all of your loans or borrowings. So this 50,000 applies to the principal amount. The thousand represents the interest amount. And so the cash balance at the end of June is $44,000, okay? And the $1,000 of interest came up with came derived from <clears throat> the interest calculation principal times your rate times the time. Okay, so and then we, as we indicated, the first part of the chapter, we have the master budget, which has the budgeted income statement and the budgeted balance sheet. So here's the budgeted income statement. We're going to sell 100,000 units at $10 each, $1 million. Good sold, that 100,000 units we sold times $4.99. And, whoops. Um, I'm trying to find that $4.99. Okay, anyway, I'll have to dig that up later. But then the cost of goods sold, 100,000 units times the $4.99 each, giving us gross margin. Remember, sales minus cost of goods sold is the $501,000 gross margin. Then you subtract selling and administrative expenses to 60. Um, I was hoping they would give us some. Um, Trying to find that information. Well, in any case, um, well, here's the calculation later. Okay, so um, this is kind of backwards, but <clears throat> anyway, so you know, we'll get to these numbers then, I guess, on this subsequent slides. So take your gross margin, subtract your selling and administrative expenses, gives us the operating income, 241,000, subtract income ex interest expense to give us our net income. How we got the cost of goods sold is, <clears throat> um, we saw that the direct materials, five pounds at a cost of 40 cents a pound, 
that's two dollars direct labor remember that uh, 0 0.05 hours for each unit and it's ten dollars an hour times the 0 0.05 hours so that's 50 cents for the direct labor part of each unit and manufacturing overhead is the 49 70 again which is the total overhead for the quarter in this case the three months 251,000 in the previous problem oh down here you can see the uh, calculation of how we got the total labor hours 1300 for April 2300 May 1450 for June same thing with the overhead manufacturing overhead dollars 251,000 here okay so we divide the dollar amount by the labor hours we get forty nine dollars and seventy cents per hour is the amount of manufacturing overhead applied to this particular unit okay multiplying that forty nine dollars and seventy cents times the zero point five hours for each unit we get two dollars and forty nine cents so the total unit cost of the cost of goods sold is four dollars and ninety nine cents and that's how we got this here okay after we've done the budgeted income statement we now prepare the budgeted balance sheet and you can see some of the balances in the balance sheet here on june 30. this is before we did the budgeted financial statements so now we're putting in the amounts that we just came up with to get to the budgeted balance sheet and um, the main thing to remember here is that for balance sheets total debits have to equal total liabilities and equity okay <laughs> uh, just a couple of uh, concepts terminology related to budgeting just in time inventory that's the concept that you don't you try not to carry a lot of inventory because inventory takes up space you have to rent extra warehouse space for inventory so you get inventory for materials for example right before you need it and you produce the units right before you're going to sell it Okay, that's just in time and again the main um, rationale or reason for having just in time is reduces storage costs the concept of zero based budgeting is that in preparing a budget most companies will say okay we'll go with whatever the budget was last year and then make adjustments for this year so either Okay, we'll keep last year's budgets and based on increases um, to our expected volume this year, we'll increase last year's budget by a little bit, for example. Or we'll look at last year's budget numbers and we'll use the same numbers for this year's budget. Okay, zero-based budgeting, on the other hand, compared to that method, is that you have to start every year at zero. And you have to re-justify every item on the budget in detail every year. So you can't use the concept of, we'll just use whatever we had last year. Zero-based budgeting is you start from zero and rebuild the budget and have to justify every dollar from that point on. Okay. Zero-based budgeting is a much more accurate budget. It cuts down on waste. Okay, but it's much more time consuming to have to start from zero and re-justify all of your expenditures. <laughs> That's the uh, lecture on chapter, was it seven? Yeah, chapter seven. Okay, the uh, hidden Easter egg is embedded in the video somewhere. I didn't specifically point it out, but it's, it's pretty obvious because I did mention it. Okay. Okay. So until next time, aloha.